Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Darwin Metzger, a former star of American Now and an Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist. Darwin is the founder and CEO of Phantom, a digital marketing and social media strategy firm. Darwin works with brands, political campaigns, TV shows, films, and celebrities. Some of the people he's worked with, Nike, Trident, DirecTV, AT&T, Fox, and BBC America. Welcome, Darwin. Thank you. My mom still has no idea what I do. And it took me a while to figure it out, too. Darwin, you've described yourself to me, to my class, to anyone who listen, as unemployable. But if you had to have a regular job, a real job, you had to be an employee, what would you be doing? So I don't know if this is going to count. And if this doesn't count, I'll give you a better answer. I think of the person whose job I'd want, and there's a specific job and a specific person. His name is Chris Saka. Okay. Uh, people, I know this name. People might recognize that name for Shark Tank. He was the most recent sort of new shark, though I think he's now off of it. He only spent two or three seasons with Shark Tank. Young guy, always wears these sort of like silly cowboy button-down shirts that has become like his signature look. He has a whole story about that. He owned a company called Lowercase Capital. And what it is, is this private investment fund where he would reach out. I, I don't want to say this is the only thing they do, but this is what I think was their bread and butter. He would figure out companies that he really wanted to invest in that he maybe couldn't get into a specific round because Sequoia sucked it all up or whoever. And he would find employees that just wanted to liquidate their stake that they had received, mm -hmm. and he would offer to buy it from them. So he ended up secretly accruing a giant chunk of Twitter, and I think he got 4% of Uber, which Uber was like mortified that one person who had not come through their filter mm -hmm. had got this giant chunk of the company. It ended up really just being him and a guy named Matt Mazzeo, who came from like the Hollywood agency world, and the two of them were just kind of this little rogue pirate ship, which in many ways, you know, I think of Phantom as being in our own world. But uh, I love what they've done. And I think, I do think venture capitalism is really fun. I just don't think I would ever get hired by anybody that I'd want to work for. And I'm pretty sure I would get fired uh, even faster. Oh, so you're saying that if you had to be an employee, you'd want to work for a VC firm? I think, yeah, I think VC, does, that, does this count as an yeah, answer? That, that, I, look, if you wanted to be a VC, no, the answer is no, it doesn't count. Begin again. But yeah. If you wanted to work for Chris Saka as yeah, I would love to or be someone like that. Yeah, to be the third the third wheel there uh, would have been a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I think in larger companies, I just that feels so nauseating to me. I don't even know. It's hard for me to even imagine it. Um, I spent a lot of time working for large companies like CBS Paramount and Tribune Broadcasting, um, and also for like relatively large startups, and mm -hmm. they're just not. Not for me. Yeah. Um, and, and what is it about? Well, actually, I, I already know one of the reasons why, mm. which is actually part of this next question. And then we'll get to the other reasons why. And that is you're a risk taker. You began your career asking MTV's comedian Tom Green for a job, job live on his show. And you showed up on Friday in Melbourne to surprise me. Right? Not knowing exactly what my schedule was going to be. This, this should be the moment when you edit this where you play the natural audio of you when you see my face, or you hear my voice, rather. Yeah, by bleeping out all the curse words that were coming out of my are, the, are you not allowed to curse on this? Uh, people will drop an occasional F-bomb. Okay, you try to keep it classy, though. I try to keep it PG-13. All right, I respect that. You know, when the Aussie guests curse, it just seems less bad. It's eloquent, isn't it? Than my er American guests curse. But yeah, we are, so, so for, for listeners, Darwin is a friend, um, and obviously not a comedian, but he's a funny person. And um, yeah, he, I had sent out a call to a bunch of people saying, I'm staying in Melbourne for this period of time. I'm in a flat for this period of time that has an extra bedroom. Whoever wants it, wants it. 
And then you just showed up without letting me know that you were coming. Your roomie's here. I know. It actually is. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and it's been a it's been a nice thing there. But so you're clearly a risk taker. You did skip the part where I had set you up on what you thought was a date, and then she got up from the table <laughs> to say, true. "Sorry, I have to go. <laughs> I've got to get this." She lifts her phone up. She's like, "Oh, I got to get this," and then you replace her at the table. Yeah, can't trust these Aussies. <laughs> They're very slick. Very I slick. Think, I didn't think of it as a date. I thought of it as a meeting. With a woman with, with in a an restaurant. Attractive, with an attractive woman. By yourselves in a restaurant. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I, yeah. Um, That's called a bait and switch, Peter. <laughs> um, it makes for a good story. Um, so I, my guess is you're, pro- you're too much of a risk taker than probably the average organization. But why else? Why? What makes you unemployable? Well, when you are, when you are a risk taker, and especially when you're at a company that you feel like needs to take risks, so... Like most companies out there. Yeah, I'll give you um, I'll give you two examples on both ends of the spectrum that I worked for. One, the company that you mentioned with Tom Green. Uh, it was a company called Mania TV. Mm-hmm. They were doing twenty four seven live internet streaming in two thousand five. Okay, so they were way ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. I was in love with the fact that they were going for it and they were going to serve a market that nobody was going after, and it totally made sense to me. Mm-hmm. The story is, of course, they wouldn't hire me, and that being said, uh, the only way I could get in the door was to call into Tom Green's show mm-hmm. live on the air while he was, I'm pretty sure, drunk, mm-hmm. and somebody was clever enough to put me to air, and anyways, that sort of worked out, but coming back to the company itself, once I got there... So he, you got a job from, from the Tom Green thing? From Tom Green, yes. Yeah. So there's a great so he clip. said yes. Yes, he and his guest both advocated for me, Bobby Badfingers, who was on the first season of, I think, X Factor, okay. or America's Got Talent, one of those sort of shows. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm going to come to Denver. I'll meet you. We'll do some videos. I'll introduce you to Mania TV. And the next day, the head of productions of Mania TV, Richard Ayub, okay. at the time head of productions there, uh, called me and said, so you coming in for an interview? Yeah. And that was like, I, I couldn't believe that that actually worked. Right. Though, by the way... Now that I say that out loud, I should have known that was going to work because that's not the only time I've asked for a job live on an air of something. And it worked. I forgot when I was a sophomore in college trying to figure out how I was going to pay with this increasing student debt, Mm -hmm. K-Rock, local uh, rock station in Denver, Mm -hmm. right? No, sorry. that's uh, K-Rock's in L.A. It's KBPI. Okay. In Denver, BPI. I think they used to do something that was called Do Yourself a Favor Tuesday or Do Yourself a Favor Wednesday. Okay. And a DJ let me pitch myself on the air there as well. To anyone who's listening. To anybody. Okay. Just say, here's who you are, here's who you represent. And if there's anybody out there that's interested in this guy, call us and we'll connect you. Right. And somebody did uh, an HVAC company okay. uh, that wanted help getting new customers. And they're like, well, you're a business student. Sounds like you're... Yeah. Uh, an affable enough guy, and uh, I ended up. Do you know Good Times? You know the burger chain in Colorado. Yes. yes. I ended up selling like through their entire chain, and that was a huge thing too. So I guess I can't believe I've just forgotten the story until now. Okay. So I guess maybe this is a move that's been in my repertoire, and I've used it more than once. So we'll see when it. So Darwin, is there any work you want right now? Absolutely not. This might be the time to make the request. Don't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> it took me going through multiple revolutions to realize, don't hire me. I have no idea what my audience will be like, but <laughs> anybody need any social media work? <laughs> <laughs> or, any strategy, or any social work? Any strategy or branding work? Yeah. <laughs> um, so back at Mania TV, which was a startup, right? And you would assume they're just in this growth mindset and they're trying to break new ground. Ha- yeah, have to be risk seeking. Yeah, I think they were all of that when they were getting their investing money Mm -hmm. or the investor dollars, which was mostly through people that were early investors in eBay. And then they set up shop and then they basically just became MTV Mm 2.0, which was not was never going to be the right model. That wasn't going to be the right model to get new viewership. Right. MTV came with already distribution and eyeballs that knew to go to you in a finite amount of choices. There wasn't quite the infinite amount of choices then as there is now. Right. But there was a much larger volume of choices. So you were going to have to do something to stand out. And I think... And you can because it's the internet. You can do anything you You can do you anything. Want. You give a show to Tom Green. And they basically told him, by the way, do whatever you want. Okay. If you want to have any sort of guest, if you want to do anything with that guest. Like they... I'm not even sure if there was anything they would censor. I don't want to get anybody there in trouble. 
But there was definitely an episode, for example, where he had like Steve-O and they were doing whip it slime on the air. Uh-huh. Like broadcast TV would have never gone for any right. of that. That's right. So, when, so that's the advantage over MTV. You can do anything. Totally. And they and what I wanted them to do was, of course, take that to that not the most extreme variation, but I wanted them to think about that when it came to marketing and getting new viewership. And the first time I really butt heads with the powers that be was I had pitched uh, to Richard Ayub, who had brought me in. I mm-hmm. pitched uh, basically a campaign for us to use our talent to hijack YouTube, which was this upstart that had great viewership right away. No content. If you went on YouTube the first year, mm-hmm. I mean, it was a, like, there was five people making content. They were terrible. Okay. There was a guy named Renetto who was just like this older, bald guy who would do baby voices, and he was a superstar <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for lack of competition. <laughs> right. So I said, look, we've got this great roster of what kind of look like MTV VJs. They're young, they're sexy, they're interesting. Let's have them do essentially blog style content. Yes, right. Kind of pitching what's now kind of the norm content and of YouTube. push people to mania. Yeah, say, hey, we're going to do a conversation today about this political issue or this lifestyle issue. Mm-hmm. Come to my live show today at 5 p.m. and you can talk to me in the chat room and we can talk about it, whatever. I was like, this is going to be great. This will be like shooting fish in a barrel. Mm-hmm. But because I hadn't presented this through um, a part of the organization that I worked for, I was working on the production team creating content. I wasn't part of the marketing team. Mm-hmm. And the CMO felt uh, just pissed. He was just mm-hmm. pissed. I think he felt like I was stepping on his toes. Okay. Which I, in some ways, I was. I wasn't meaning to. Well, you you're, you are stepping on his toes if you have a, a hierarchical organization in which things have to go up through a chain of demand and people have to get proper credit and so on. You know, and so on. You're not stepping on someone's toes if if you're like everybody in this organization is a problem solver and is a creative person and should be helping the the organization succeed. Which is what I thought being in a startup meant. Now I know that some startups, but it depends culture to culture. And this one, I should have, I should have seen the lack of growth happening or the lack, the lack of attempt to growth happening. And it should have clued me into just like ride this wave, be slow and steady. Don't try to, yeah. to, to shake or, the or approach that idea differently. Yeah. And then the other example, working with Tribune Broadcasting. This is an, uh, a company for people that don't know that owns a bunch of broadcast TV stations, mm-hmm. a bunch of newspapers. Uh, depending on when this goes live, they will either have had most of their assets purchased by Sinclair, which is this conservative group that's just trying to buy as much media as possible. Um, and then I think they're just finishing, finalizing the sale of the LA Times yeah, to right. a, a local LA billionaire, which is actually, I think, for all... Uh, all it's possible local. outcomes is, is worthwhile. Oh, At least sorry. it's a local person, relatively local sort of political views and lifestyle views. So this is a company, though, if you're thinking about print newspapers yes. and local television news channels, right. like you're a dead duck. Like you're a dinosaur <laughs> with one leg in the La Brea tar pits. And so... Again, I felt like part of my job, even though this was not my job, and maybe that's my issue and why I'm unemployable, is I feel like if I can add value outside of my Mm -hmm. job description, it's my responsibility to offer it. Mm -hmm. So my job there was to first broadcast a live tech report that aired three times a week on a few stations. I then grew that across the entire Tribune network and through another TV group called uh, The Local Group. Uh, It's kind of a cheesy technology report was meant to explain high tech topics to sort of average everyday people. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we would be with Steve Jobs for everything he was uh, doing his, his last three years of life. Let me, I want to say that part again, because that's, that's a terrible sentence. (laughs) Uh, I got to follow around Steve Jobs for the last three years of his life. And we'd be at every keynote, but we'd also uh, would explain new tech platforms. Like when Twitter came Mm -hmm. out, that was during our reign. Yeah. And of so course, nowadays you'd be explaining the blockchain and stuff like that. This yeah. year would have all been about esports, crypto, AR. Uh, we certainly would be covering everything that Elon Musk is doing uh-huh. from right. SpaceX yeah, to Tesla. It's he, like uh, David Pogue, but for broadcast. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and for, for those of you who don't know, David Pogue's a New York Times tech writer. He's sort of like a dad. 
Yeah. I'm like a dad there's, talking about tech. There's a few dads out there, and they're, they're dads that speak to slightly different audiences. There's Walt Mossberg as well. Okay. But that's, this stuff's valuable. You need this. I mean, look, I think, to me, the word technology is kind of silly, because that should just be... A technology business is just the best version of that business, right? Every business should be employing technology. And I think there's still a gap between the value that technology can offer and the average person's ability to perceive that value. Mm -hmm. And really, I think the biggest issue, by the way, with crypto and why crypto isn't being adapted faster is it's like trying to explain the internet to people in like 1991 and you're trying to explain code and JavaScript and like an average person is just like shaking their head and muttering versus now you explain like, well, you could have access to every piece of information in the world at all times and every piece of content in the mm -hmm. world of all times. And by the way, you could build whatever business you want, no matter where you are in the world. Then people would say, oh, that sounds incredible and impossible. But it's not. Of course, that's what that's it's what they end up doing. That's right. Well, Hold on. You were saying you were saying about Tribune. Yes. And, and this tendency for you to kind of reach out. And not only so, and sometimes just offer your opinion. Yeah, here's what I think we should do, mm -hmm. and here's why. But then, in this case, you started actually doing it. Yeah. Well, so imagine the scenario. So it's it's 2009. I'm in a company where every station we own is getting a little bit less viewership, and a little bit less viewership, and a little bit less viewership. Twitter is just. Starting, mm -hmm. And I'm seeing the same exact parallel that I saw with YouTube, right. which was there is viewership and this ravenous consumer that like three people are competing for. Mm -hmm. Back then, the only people making it's content, like Ashton Kutcher. it was Ashton, <laughs> right. CNN uh -huh. and Shaquille O'Neal. OK, OK, wonderful. Yeah. Well, after those three, <laughs> right. you had so much opportunity. And I, again, look at the Tribune. Uh, broadcasting network. I look at every TV market they have, the talent within that TV market. I mean, these are stars. In LA, if you're a news anchor on KTLA, you're not necessarily the biggest star in LA. But you're still a somebody in LA. And if you go to every other market Tribune has a station, you are generally, other than the, the top athlete and maybe the football coach of the local college, you're probably the biggest People name. People know you. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. So you, you have the best opportunity to build an audience. So naturally, my push was to everyone to try to create this urgency around, we need to migrate our content to Twitter, mm -hmm. but also to Facebook and to YouTube and trying to push them to building audiences there. This was Facebook pre-IPO. Okay. So the only difference to mention pre-IPO Facebook and post-IPO Facebook was before they realized they had to make money for investors, mm -hmm. they had no paywall and no firewall. If you had 10,000 followers and you posted something, all 10,000 would see that post, right, right. right? And now you're starting to see them throttle Instagram. Just assume any Facebook product that you build an audience on, yes. they will throttle in exchange for you paying them to That's be right, yeah. de-throttled, unthrottled. What's uh, the opposite of throttled? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good Unsiloed. Question. But fast-tracked or whatever that would be. Yeah. I, mean, I get so, what you're saying. Yes. So I can remember the beginning of the end is one of the news executives had a consultant, real name, Brent Payne, okay. who worked for sort of Tribune Tower out of, you know, sort of the uh, corporate he headquarters, <clears throat> and had Brent come to the newsroom to start strategizing how we were going to grow our digital footprint. So this was, you know, a good six months after I tried to push this agenda, and I said, okay, this is wonderful. This is when yeah, the time is like, coming. Yeah, you're like, Brent's going to be my boy. He's going to be my man. Yeah. And now I've had six more months to experiment with Facebook and Twitter for our reports, right? Because as a journalist, you're testing everything we're reporting on. We don't just get an iPhone from Apple and say, this is good. We kick the tires on it. Right. Same thing with Twitter. We don't just say, oh, we think your mom should be on this. We say, well, let's figure out the use case and is it going to be realistic, et cetera. So Brent comes in and I, I can still remember this meeting. I should have just kept my mouth shut. Of course I can't. It's impossible for me. And so once he dives in, I just started basically pitching everything I've been trying to get yes. consensus you're, and room on. You're excited about it, too. I was passionate, yes. and I was in love with it. And Brent points to the news director, points to me, and says, this is your guy. Telling the news director, you should listen to Darwin. Oh, wow. Why aren't you guys doing what Darwin's saying? 
And I remember him rolling his eyes and then staring me down. And I was like, wait, who, wait, who? The news director. Rolling his eyes like this kid? We're going to listen to Yeah, him. this guy, this tall, gangly guy? Yeah. No way. Um, and that was the beginning of the end yeah. there. This is why you mentioned Brent by name. Yeah. So not Brent. Brent was absolutely a champion. That's what I mean. That's why you mentioned Brent by name. Yeah, we don't have to mention the other guy by name. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. No, no, no. That's what I mean. I was yeah. like, oh, wow, he's about to destroy this guy, Brent. He named him by name. No, no, no. No, Brent is, and Brent is an OG in this world. He's been an SEO expert for many years, which uh, for people that are listening that don't know what SEO is, search engine optimization. Right. These are the people that once upon a time were helping you get your listing to the top of Google. Uh, uh, on top of Alta Vista. Yeah, Alta, yeah, Lycos. <laughs> Ask God. Jeeves. It's, you know, boy, if you, can you imagine working for Lycos, just assuming you were going to win? Yeah. It's like, like, I'm going to be I liked there. Alta Vista when it was, uh, that was my search engine of choice at one point. You know, I can tell right away that Google was the best choice only because it was so easy to use and I always preferred what they would show me and that's how I knew yeah. they were going to buy YouTube. And the reason I say that is I'm at Mania TV, I'm testing YouTube, there was another one that was called Live Something and then there was a third competitor and I just remember searching for something on YouTube and I was like, wow, this is like being on Google. Yeah. This search algorithm is giving me exactly what I'm looking for. And then I'd come to our company and I would search something in and I'd be like, I know this video is here. I, I can't even find it. We uploaded it. Can't find it. Um, yeah, you know, also, I mean, you can see Google's effect on YouTube. One thing I like about YouTube is the recommendation element. To mm. it. Like, I like that it's, it sort of through suggest videos to me it's not perfect by any means it's not as good as like netflix algorithm but it's still i regularly get interesting stuff um and it serves two purposes because it does benefit us and i agree with you it, it it's great at reading meta tags and the context of the content i'm watching and giving me great offerings that are in that same vein but also it gives them one more reason to have a paid integration where somebody can pay to have part of that real yes, estate that's right that makes sense um so Okay, so this, I mean, I, and I know you well, so so, um, I think you're a lot like me. I have a saying is that I like to give advice and I like to take advice. And I, so I'm, I actively solicit advice a lot, like a lot more than I think the average person does. You were the, you were, uh, I'm, this is not uh, BS because we're on your podcast. <laughs> okay. um, I think you were the most gracious person I've ever met as it comes to um, soliciting feedback from others and then actually actively taking steps based on that feedback. Now, I know you're not a pushover uh -huh. and you are very like content to say, I don't see it that way, but I'll hear you out. I'll listen yeah. to it. So I, I agree with this assessment. I, yeah. And I, I, I think that's important. Like I think there are wisdom in crowds and I, and so of course I ask people whose opinion I respect. I ask smart people, I ask people who know about the topic and I often ask people who know me, so because I, I think that the advice has to be in some ways appropriate given whoever the recipient is. And it, I think you're right. If someone says, if I start getting the same, the same thing, I'm like, oh, I got to really rethink this. Um, but I also I also like to give advice, and and I like to give advice because like if it can feel good to try to help people live a better life. No, wait. Is well, this all a segue to bring up how you told me I had to clip my nose hair? <laughs> no. no, but that's a nice example of it. And by the way, that's a true story for people <laughs> listening to this. I, I told Darwin, I, I put my hand on his shoulder and looked into his eyes and I said, it's time. And, and I'm like, what are we going to talk about? Are we going to talk about like, does he think I need to go faster with my fiance in our relationship? I re need to reconsider what I'm doing for my life. And I said, it's time to buy a nose hair trimmer. <laughs> um, you're not the first person, 30 something that I've done that to. That's the critical it time period. Awfully Early young 30s. to have to clip your nose hair, guys. <laughs> it happens fast. Um, but what, I've really pulled back on giving advice. And I did so because I realized that not most people don't want it as much as I, I want it. Um, they're polite, but, you know, usually I feel like I, I kind of came to the opinion that I'm kind of wasting my breath a lot of the time. And so unless someone solicits, 
where I sort of feel like I'm close enough that it'll it'll be heard. But I real I keep asking for it, but I stopped giving it. But I'm going somewhere with this. I just want to quickly say yes. that I think. I think you should keep giving advice, and I think even though you think it's falling on deaf ears because they're not being gracious about it, I'm not going to mention a specific name, but we do have a mutual friend that you gave tough love to yeah. several years ago, a piece of advice this person needed to hear, and they have absolutely, they did not listen then, they shut you down immediately, yeah. and they have absolutely taken it to heart, and their life is vastly improved because of it, so I would just say... Uh, I do agree that you shouldn't expect people to be gracious like you are. Yeah, I no. still think you should give it. There's, look, I live in LA. This is the you know the world center uh, center meeting place for people who smile to your face and then flip you the bird behind your back. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be like that. What you're sure. doing is not necessarily the opposite because you're not trying to upset them. You're trying to help them, but you're going to deal with a little bit of pain in the short term, but you're going to help them in the long term. So I don't know. I would encourage you to continue with that, but. Sorry, continue. continue yeah, with your that, that's nice. I just, I'm not, and I've had some people say to me, "Pete, you, you feel free, right? You know, at any time." When I, whenever I brought this up, can I, I mean, just say right now then some... that I'm giving you the feel free card? Okay. Definitely onward. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. I'm happy to do it, do it with you. I mean, I think that's why. If I, I mean, it's pro why I probably should consider writing another book, because that. that's a that's a place where people are saying, "I want to hear this." Mm. And you know what I mean? It's like, so do you think anybody's ever there. opted into like reading a self help book and they're like, screw you. I don't need to change my diet. Who do you think you exactly. are to just slam the book shut? Yeah, these are receptive. Yeah. These are receptive people. Um, but I think you're similar. Um, you're similar. Actually, you're, people are going to listen to this and be like, God, those guys love each other. Yeah. <laughs> But um, why? Because I flew 15 <laughs> hours to the other side of the globe to surprise you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, so people, so so I notice this with you is this is like you'll go. You know what these people should do? You know what so and so should do? Mm. And you'll come up with some idea for a business or for a show. Um, I don't know what I can repeat because what you you might actually try to do, but like you regularly come up with show ideas that folks could be doing it's just the way I think it's the way your mind works is like you like solving problems you're a creative guy and you're excited about whatever those things are I mean it's, an example that I don't mind saying because sure. I have no involvement with it and it was just merely an idea you and I are uh, we're together in Las Vegas we're watching NBA Summer yes, League perfect example and uh, NBA Summer League, for people who don't know what that is, is several teams. It used to only be six or seven teams. I think I read this year it's going to be the entire NBA. I wouldn't be surprised. You have your first and second year players play during the summer before the season begins, all in the same arena, and it is awesome. They have a few different courts. You pay, what is it, 35 bucks a day. Yes. You can watch eight games back to back to yes. back. And it's like it's great basketball because a lot of these kids are fighting for a roster slot, and then you get to see Lonzo Ball and Jason Tatum and these other young stars. And what I realized was like could not be more obvious to me was there's one league that needs summer league much more than NBA, and that's the NHL. Yes. The NHL, first of all, when you get drafted in the NHL, you're drafted at age 17. Okay. So you're not necessarily going to play in the NHL for four years or five years. So there's never any ramp up time for people to get to know who you are uh -huh. until you're already like a 25 year old man. I would love to see the NHL, who by the way, just created a new franchise in Las Vegas, do a summer league, whether it's in Las Vegas or perhaps go to one of the Canadian cities that should have an NHL team like Quebec City okay. and just do a summer festival, two weeks, everybody gets to play. And if you can't find a TV broadcast partner, which I don't think would be hard, I would try to partner with Twitch, which is mostly, it's digital streaming, mostly people watching other people play video games. But in one of their quarterly reports they released, I think a year ago, it showed that NHL hockey was the favorite sport of everybody on this platform, which has a hundred million people watching every month. And I don't know if you follow NHL TV ratings like I do, because I'm a dork. Uh, they're not great, mm -hmm. and they're getting significantly less viewership than this app. So, anyways, that was one of the ideas that just sort of sprung up in the yeah, in so the you, yeah, that's right. And, and I thought it was a great idea, in part, well, for a variety of reasons. But like, so you're doing this, right? So, so you're doing this just on the fly, 
if you're at, if you're at a job, you're doing it all the time, yes. right? Because this is your your job can consume consumes a third of your life easily. So what you well, if you're an entrepreneur, done, it, can, it consumes sixty yeah. percent well, more. Really, yeah, that's right. I'm thinking of you, if you yeah. in your role as employee. Oh yes, yeah. Um, so essentially, what I think you've done at Phantom, you can correct me if you disagree, is you've basically tricked people into listening to you. Yeah, that's right. And by the way, part of that as they pay you to listen to you now and do what you say. <laughs> and we have, you know, pretty much a hundred percent repeat and referral business. So not only do they listen, they choose to keep listening and then they tell others to mm -hmm. listen, which by the way, per your advice about having that audience that has their sort of ears open and they're willing to hear that feedback and that advice. Um, it's a big part of our philosophy. We don't have a sales team, right? We don't market ourselves. Uh -huh. If we have to convince you that we're valuable, we're not going to work for you because we're going to probably have to get you out of your comfort zone and teach you to see the landscape in a way you haven't yet. And unless you really want that, yeah. it's going to be very uncomfortable. I think that's right. That's a good, that's a nice way to put it. Um, do you, do you like have to onboard people? Like, so even if someone wants your service, do you like, you say, listen, here are the ground, do you have ground rules? Do you have like, how do you brief someone to be ready for some of the far out stuff that you guys suggest? So we no longer accept new clients to bring them immediately into the fold and actually conduct work and campaigns for them. Uh, you have to, if you want to become a client, you have to essentially go through a program where we require you to sign a consulting agreement that feels a lot like a therapist session okay where you're going to tell us what you think your diagnosis is okay and then we're going to start chiseling away at that until we start to until you start to see what your actual diagnosis is and we try to treat it the same way your therapist would okay. or a politician would right so it's not like a contract it doesn't feel like a contract it's it's a it's a brief generally one to two day though in some cases it's been two weeks where you have to basically pay us in advance for a certain amount of hours to do these sort of therapy sessions. And then we're going to give you a blueprint as to here's what your diagnosis looks like. Okay. If you're willing to accept that this is what your diagnosis is, uh -huh. we can discuss what it would cost for us to help fix it. Oh, that's interesting. But otherwise, feel free to take this diagnosis to anywhere else, right. to another agency, or ingest it in-house yeah. and deal with it as you see fit. Have you thought about... Um creating a less phantom like version of Fanta Fanta, excuse me, Phantom <laughs> that is like a little more traditional, right? So you're like, you know, Phantom can't help you, but, but Fanta can. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? Whatever it <laughs> yeah. might be, you know, um, in order to, in order to grow the business where you have kind of your risk seeking some desperate, sure. some, you know, cause you know, that what's interesting is, <laughs> Um, risk seeking can come from a place of weakness and it can come from, from a place of strength, mm. right? So, so the, the place of strength is we know that to be traditional, like Tribune is just kicking the can down the road. Um, and so you know that in the, in the long run, that's a dominant strategy in business. Like the other one is, oh my God we're we're finished or it looks like we're finished let's throw our hail mary right that's where risk seeking comes from in this in this world but most people sit in the middle they're limping along they're doing okay growth is steady it's okay you know i mean life is okay um and and the bigger the organization gets and the more hierarchical it gets and the more the people who have work in it have mortgages the more risk risk averse it gets in that way. That's a market that you could serve, but you wouldn't serve in the same way you do at Phantom. Well, we're, so I'll give, I'm guessing the answer is no, you're not interested in that, but I'm curious. I, yeah, I'll give, I'll give two responses to that. The first one I'd mention is we do work, um, along that sort of, uh, line that you drew in many places. We do work with some of the fat and happy companies. Okay. Um, I love working with a company that wants to throw a Hail Mary. Okay. And I think those are the companies that are the most interesting, though I would much rather work with them before they had their tumultuous problem when they were really in a positive point of frame, uh, a frame of reference for sort of living in that growth, that growth moment. Um, 
I give an example of another agency that is happy to work with large companies and ones that are having moments of desperation, mm -hmm. uh, which I think in many ways we try to be the dirtier, smaller, more rogue version of which is Wyden and Kennedy. Okay. Examples would be, of course, they work with clients like Nike, which is as blue chip as you get, but they also work with Old Spice. Mm -hmm. And when they signed their contract with Old Spice, it was a dead brand. It had uh, only a few QRLs left. Um, and it was... It's yeah, it was an old brand. It, it was done. And the people who done. used it were dying. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, through Wyden and Kennedy, they start working with people like Terry Crews and Eric Warheim. And they come up with, like, some of the wildest and craziest ads, including my favorite ad campaign, which didn't even last that long, called Director Wolf Dog. Okay. Uh, feel free to Google Director Wolf Dog. I'll put it in the in the session notes. Which, I always have exhibits. Okay, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant brand account, uh, which I think in many ways set the tone uh, for some of the great brand accounts on Twitter uh, that have come out in the last couple of years, like Wendy's. I don't think anybody does it as good as Wendy's right now because they've been given the green light by that company. To be, yeah, to be irreverent. To be irreverent and funny and yes. memeable. And you know what? If somebody wants to talk smack about right. Wendy's... Don't throw some shade. Yeah. Throw shade right back at them. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. And they're brilliant. Yeah. Um, so those guys are able to work with these big, bigger brands, and they have they you know they have the special sauce. Yeah. People believe that they're the ones to work with if you want to be edgy. Sure, and I mean, look, they had the luxury of you know we helped build some of Nike's campaigns early on Facebook and uh, some of their great content that they did with LeBron James and a few of their products there. But like White and Kennedy helped build Nike. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so the difference is you know we can take credit for like. A, uh, a blip on one quarterly report, whereas White and Kennedy can take credit for the quarterly report. Right. So when they go to a new brand, they're able to get so much done and get so much trust in the room because you just, you have that incredible of a track record. They've also been around a lot, a lot longer than Phantom. Uh, but I think back to your, the first part of your question, I would not create that offshoot of Phantom because I'm not, I don't want to have Phantom take money for things that aren't going to solve the problems that companies need solved. And I'm not going to say we won't try to facilitate things. If you feel like your big problem is you need a new website and you wish you had some influencer marketing behind it, we'll help facilitate those things. But we're going to be very honest with you the whole time mm -hmm. with saying that, no, what you actually need is a sales funnel and you're not following up with these clients. And here's this database of 100,000 right. emails that you should be utilizing. Yeah. Here's this boring drip campaign that you need to run. Sometimes boring <laughs> is the sexiest thing there is. Of and course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason for, in that example, why a drip campaign is so important, I don't know if your, your audience might not know what a drip campaign is. We don't have to get too technical, but email is the only platform right now where I can access a consumer without having to go through a paywall or a firewall. Yes. Right? Any platform, technically, okay, you could give an example like Twitter. I could reach Twitter. However, yeah. two things. One, I'd better still have my content on the timeline when the person actually looks at Twitter. Right. Number two, if Twitter decides they want to throttle, which they absolutely might some point in the future, you know, Jack Dorsey's getting a lot of pressure from his board. We need to increase revenue. Right. They may go to brands. Everybody else is throttling. Why wouldn't Twitter? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? And why wouldn't you tell the brands, by the way, we're going to throttle you and you're going to have to pay us money to maintain your blue check mark. Yes. Right. Maintain this. But by the way, we'll give you some sales, you know, metrics that you can measure your engagement and some tools right. like that that we think are going to be invaluable, even though, of course, that's just smokescreen. Just like Edge Rank was smoke screened for Facebook. Well, the smoke okay. screen was. <laughs> I think we're going a little. Too Are we going too much? Oh my god! <laughs> Take us some water. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, so just mm. so a drip campaign um, in, is sort of a thing where people are considered. Let me be a marketing professor for just a moment. So the idea is this: is you so a, a company might have leads. So these are potential customers. These aren't people who are buying the product. And they have some designation in terms of how interested they seem to be based upon their behavior. And it would, what a drip campaign is, a piece of information is kind of sent their way. Maybe it's an email, maybe um, maybe it's a newsletter or something like this, or you, as you said, a tweet or, a, or something on Facebook or whatever. And if that customer engages with that drip, 
then their propensity score goes up, essentially, and then they become what's called basically more qualified, and they can then be targeted by a salesperson and so on. And it looks a lot in that way, the way a sales funnel is used on any platform. So just to give a, qu- a very quick example yeah. on Facebook. <laughs> As people are fast-forwarding through this. Yeah. Oh, fun. my God. <laughs> <laughs> Plus 15 seconds. Plus Let me go back to the Jimmy seconds. Carr episode. <laughs> God. Do you think you're going to get a lot of emails saying, please never interview someone who's not a comedian ever again? I, you're my third, I think. Third or fourth. Oof. <laughs> Kids, you might learn something, though. But so. it's a lot about the lives of funny people. It's not about being funny. Okay, that's good to know. Well, I, I just want to say this as an example. If I was a food company... Uh-huh. You can make the choice to just put a bunch of Facebook video ads selling your product, which I think is dumb. That's basically going to the bottom of the sales funnel trying to get a conversion. Yes. Or I could put out a video about how to make the world's best pepperoni pizza. Right. And then based on how many people watched 30 seconds or more of that, I'm going to target them now with videos of here's how to make homemade pasta sauce. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have a brief mention for ragu within that video and if people watch a significant amount of that video I'm going to start targeting them with ragu ads yeah it's really nice I, I mean you know as much as people hate mar- sales especially and then and then sometimes marketing and branding but the nice thing about a good drip campaign is that it actually does a very good job of getting rid of people who don't care about the message yeah who aren't qualified because they don't watch the content that's right they're not interested and so it's better than broadcast in that way yeah. um, I mean anything's better than broadcast Broadcast. No, no, but I mean, I mean, when I say broadcast, I mean in principle. Oh, sure, it's just sure, like sure, sure. Smashing the world with a bunch of, of stuff and, and, pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah, they call it spray and pray, yes, right? Where you right. just buy billboards, you have your magazine ads, you have your broadcast ads. You really don't even know how many people are watching this care about your product. Yes. But somebody at a sales team has told you, well, this has this sort of reach, and there's going to be this many viewers on this telecast, so you should expect that you have 10 million impressions. Nobody knows what that means. No, I know. Usually the people who tell you the stuff are the ones selling you this stuff. That's right. Um, well, so can, we, can we touch on that for a second? I just that? want to mention briefly, one of the core guiding principles of Phantom is that we're not trying to sell our own book because we're, not, we're completely agnostic to every platform. Yeah. So if you are a TV ad salesman, you tell people that TV ad sales are the most important thing for your company. We don't work for Facebook or for broadcast, or for print, or for influencers we, we might utilize, right. or for developers we might bring in for a, uh, a website, or the producers we might bring in for a video campaign. We start with, we advocate for whoever hires us, we come up with what we think is the path of best resistance for them, and then we start figuring out who's the best qualified to help achieve yes, that right. goal, and it doesn't matter to us what direction we go. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really fascinating thing about these ad agencies where they started to move beyond just being creative and doing strategy, which I think it's hard to do creative without strategy. But then what happened was they became the ones who were selling the, selling the ad space or buying the ad space and taking a cut and so on. So that immediately is going to adjust what their motivations are. And they're going to, if they're, if they're able to sell TV invariably they're going to say we should do some commercials yeah like you know the classic model if you're watching mad men that's a very yes, typical model yes. which is we will give you don draper for free and he's going to put on uh you know a show for you and you're going to think like wow they really get my product we don't care that's free all we care is that you're going to give us your entire media buy yes that's which right. is like doing two minutes of work for us and we're going to charge you 15 percent. so if you want to spend 15 million dollars on tv ads we're going to take, you know, a giant chunk of that yes. in what amounts to basically one single sheet we fill out and give to ABC and CBS and NBC. Yes. All right. Hey, I, I know I knew that this pod was going to go long um, because I know us um, and we're going to we can shut this down and continue over dinner as needed. But I want to hit a few more rapid fire questions because sure. this is supposed to be about your life. And so. Um, Give me the beats in your day quickly. Like, what's a typical day for Darwin? So, at, we were discussing yesterday, uh, or I think the day before, the three different segments of sleepers, right? You have yes. the larks, the, the larks, which are waking up, you know, at some atrociously early time. It's actually right here. It's, oh, it's, it's a, um, it was Daniel under pink. More than one watch. Why do you own so many watches? I just have two. One. These are really nice, by the way. 
Larks, owls, and third birds. So larks are early risers, that's me. Third birds are what the majority of the population is. You know, they get up at seven or eight and they go to bed around, you know, 11 or midnight kind of thing. And then um, owls, which is what you are. Which, by the way, I think is 21% of the population. So that's, that's higher than I would have guessed. And it, well, and it's society skews towards early birds and the larks, yeah. right? I think if you're an owl, even if you're really productive, you're often sort of thought of as deviant in some way, though you could yeah. accomplish just or, as much. Or you're forced, you know, so the, 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 the issue is this is like teenagers are owls, but they're forced onto a third bird schedule because of school, for instance. So their natural proclivity is to go to bed later. That changes, obviously, across the across development. But except on, except for me, apparently. I, I missed that part of the development. So yeah. um, one of the other great things about working for an agency that you've built is you get to decide the culture and what's really meaningful there. Yes. For starters, optics is not something that's important to Phantom. We don't need to see everybody with their butt in their chair during specific hours. Mm -hmm. You have projects, you have deadlines, and we have very high expectations for performance. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you can contribute meaningfully to the team from Dubai or in Melbourne, as mm -hmm. is the example with me this week, that's perfectly fine. So... Uh, I generally wake up probably around 10.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. I might wake up later than that if I feel like I need to sleep. The second I wake up, I open my phone, I turn it off airplane mode, mm -hmm. I punch in Postmates, mm -hmm. and I order the most disgusting organic juice you could possibly right. have, just greens with no fruit. Mm -hmm. And while I'm waiting for that to be delivered to me, mm -hmm. I start going through all of the emails that have started to amass over the morning. Right, because there's all these larks from New York City and beyond <laughs> emailing Where's this you. proposal? Where was this report? <laughs> no, they're very nice. Our customers are very nice. But yes, I'm going through all those and making sure that anybody on my team has whatever they need mm -hmm. to move forward. And by the way, you'll hear at the back end of my day why this isn't that much of a problem. Can I, can I say something for a second? Yep. about? So I'm on a weird owl schedule here in Melbourne, mm -hmm. not because I'm getting up um, late. I'm still getting up rather early. But when I wake up, it's like noon or one o'clock. Or by the time I get on email, it's two or three o'clock mm -hmm. back home. Right. And so I have a full inbox of stuff that's waiting for me when I get on there, which is probably what you have, right? If you get up at 11, you've got a a big load of email there waiting that's that has been sent and prior. Let me ask you this. How does that feel for you? You know, I... Um, As I, somebody who's very OCD and you like things to be done in a timely manner. I, yeah, I, I've... So I like it, and here's why I like it. Because if I do what I ought to be doing, which is not be on email first thing in the morning, you and I live different lives where, where email is um, is a punishment, you know, is like a punishment and not a... It's not a revenue generating kind of, um, it's not a value generating kind of, uh, of task. Writing a paper is a value generating task. If, I, if I'm good and I actually do creative work for some period of time and then sit down and do my email, it forces me to batch email in a way that I don't at home because email's coming in constantly. But if I, I wake up, there's 50 emails there and then I go through the 50 emails and I take care of a bunch of it. If I've done it late enough, those emails don't come back right away. At home, if you send an email at 9 a.m., you have a response at by 1. But if you, if you respond to emails that are in the afternoon back home, they may not come back to the next day. It actually creates a pretty nice lag for me. So um, I've, been enjoying, I've been enjoying the batching part of it. But I do feel some urgency because I know they're sitting there. Yeah, and I like that too. And I like I like having batch email responses. And it's, I can get it's so the much. Only time. way to really do this if if you're trying to do creative work. And I know you and I have spoken before about the fact that you are at the top or near the top of your performance very early on in your day, which makes sense. Yes. For the sort of sleep sleeper you are. For me, my best performance, and we'll get to that as we go through my schedule is at 11 at night. Yeah. So by going through emails, what I do first, of course, I start with the simplest emails that I can respond to right away. Uh -huh. And it starts to basically become this great warm-up device so that at 
as I, you know, get through that first hour, Mm -hmm. I can still be really, really productive without missing a beat. At this point, I've had my juice. I've gotten most of those small fires put out. There might be a few larger fires that are on my radar. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I'm going to have some food at home or have something else delivered, I'll take care of that. I have an office that's only about five blocks from where I live. Mm -hmm. So I will walk there generally with my dog, uh, the superstar Yorkie known as Bowie. And from there, I'll have a small team meeting with a few of our core teammates and start working on some of these larger fires. At this point, I will have generally back to back to back to back meetings or calls with clients or with teams as we're executing different campaigns. We may have a few different brainstorming sessions as well throughout the day. I will always take time to have food, Mm -hmm. uh, just much like I take time to sleep. I don't think it makes any sense for people to be hungry and tired. I don't think you're productive that way. Mm -hmm. So, and I encourage people from my team, like you're not going to be a hero because you didn't get up to have lunch today. Mm -hmm. You'd be a hero because you were working in a great rhythm you took care of yourself and you're not going to be burnt out next week. Yeah, it's we resilience it. training. That's right. Yeah. So at this point, let's say it's now seven o'clock or eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. The office day is now winding down. I will walk home, make sure the dog is fed, get my gym clothes on, go to my gym and get a workout in. Generally, that will end around 10 or 1030. Yeah. So this is always like a negotiation when I'm in L.A., so so Darwin, Darwin let, gets me into his, his fancy gym, and we do these long workouts that are like half chatting and half working out, and I love it. But you always want to start it at 7.30, and I always want to start it at 5.30. And then the, the question is, it never starts at 5.30, and it never starts at 7.30. That's just the starting point to the negotiation, and it just ends up somewhere between six and seven usually. Depends on who of us really wants that workout (laughs) to happen, and we'll bend a little bit. So I'll go through my workout, I'll come home, uh, I'll make a protein shake, get in the shower, and by this point it's around 11 o'clock, and this Uh is my time to really think deeply. Emails have stopped coming in. Right. My phone has stopped ringing. And now, of course, it's not just email and phone. You have Telegram. You have Discord. You have Slack. You have WhatsApp. Uh You have Skype. I'm getting DMs on Twitter. I'm getting DMs on Instagram. I'm getting Uh DMs on Snapchat. Right. And you're having to deal with all of these at the same time. This is the moment where almost all of that stops. And I can think deeply about what is the next strategic move for our clients, for our team. And because... We have this incredibly fluid philosophy to find where there's an arbitrage opportunity or a green you know, field or blue ocean, whatever your adage is. Uh, <laughs> a black wall. Man, a green. <laughs> a <yeah>. white <laughs> canvas. Uh. <laughs> An unused condom. You know, there's opportunity everywhere, Pete. And I also read and listen to a lot of podcasts. So I'm constantly consuming content, mostly relevant to our industry. I also like to, as as we've discussed, I like to to know a lot about the financial and investment world, but I will have generally something going on in the background. Right now I'm listening to Ray Dalio's uh, principles. Mm -hmm. And while I'm listening to that, I'll be taking down notes as it applies to whatever I'm consuming. And at the same time, writing down notes for whatever ideas I want to pitch or a clever campaign that we might have. And I go to bed generally around two or two 30 mm-hmm. and I wake up and I do the same thing yeah. again. So a couple, one observation is, um, yeah, you, you do, you know, you, you have, you, you kind of have this long day and lots happening and you jam a lot of things into it, which I appreciate As someone who jams a lot into his day. I, I appreciate other people who do that and seem to do it well, but also having, um, I, I hate the word balance, but like you take care of yourself, which is, I think you, you eat good food, you find time to, um, to exercise and to play a little bit, you know, throughout this time. So th- here, here's three quick questions. How do you, how is it like, it's hard to say, like, do you have a creative process? Like, 
is there is there like some trick or tip that you have for how do you come up with these ideas? Um, that's the first question. Second question is, you say you're writing things down. Where are you putting them? Um, that's there. And then the third question is, and this is partially a test if you'll remember all the questions. So far, I'm good. What are you reading, watching, listening to that really stands out hmm. as like, wow, that listeners should know about? Gotcha. Okay. So... My process is really a compounding effect of all the little things that I'm doing over the course of my day. I know some of the best creatives I know will literally just lock themselves in a cave and they'll force themselves to look at a pen and paper for eight hours and mm -hmm. they'll come back with ideas. I don't operate that way. I operate when I'm listening to people that push me. Mm -hmm. So that will be part of answer number three or question number three. And I start to figure out where are all of these synergies that should be obvious to everyone and they should be obvious to me. Um, I find often what I'm doing at night when I'm trying to figure out whatever's the most deep creative work that I'm working on, I, I will find myself finding a natural wall. Mm -hmm. And then I will go to sleep and I will make sure, by the way, every night I'm sleeping at least eight hours. If I'm not getting eight hours, I find some way in my day to try to recoup what sleep I didn't get. And as I go through different cycles of REM sleep, I will often wake up having just had a dream where I had the answer come okay. to me, where I was working on the problem in the dream. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of my body rehearsing it again and again and again while I sleep will lead to where those ideas come up. And a lot of times I won't necessarily know that idea when I wake up. I won't sit up and go, Eureka, it will happen during a 6 you know, p.m. meeting at the end of our day. And I'll realize, oh, yes, I've already had this conversation mm -hmm. we're having right now a hundred times last night. And here's the name that I think we should give this product or here's mm -hmm. the direction I think we should go for distribution with this campaign. So it's a it's a process that it feels nebulous. It involves consuming as much thought provoking material as possible. And then I always try to take it to that step three or four or five. It's not just mm -hmm. good enough to hear something that's interesting. You have to take in an interesting idea and think where else is this applicable? Mm -hmm. How could that idea be better? Mm -hmm. Because every idea can be a slightly better idea, but most people are too lazy to take it to another level. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of where I write everything down and where mm -hmm. I sort of track this, a lot of it I try to keep on my phone, okay. so I always have it with me. Uh, I do still do the old school yellow pad and paper, uh -huh. uh, but I think my regular notes on iPhone, just the generic note app, I have, uh, what's it called, I have Evernote and you know a few apps like sure. that, but the truth is I just want the one that I can press the button and start typing, Yeah. and it's organized enough for me to go back to it. Right. I did this week accidentally delete an entire note of certain projects that I had in mind, but uh, so there, there's some downside to using that app. Cause that's like, the, what's this? Yeah, that's, um, yeah. Whoops, I, I just deleted the yeah. cure to cancer. So I, um, so I want to tell a quick story about you to, to the listeners. So I, I have you come speak to my MBA class. I try to, my goal is to have you come out to Boulder every year and do it. Um, and so one, one of the fun stories is I, I usually start class with something, um, I just call it current events. And so the students bring up current events that are related to marketing. And then we pick the one that, that we want to talk about as a class. And then we do a, a, not a deep dive, but you know, this is a 10 minute part of the class. And, um, and you were waiting, you were sitting in the audience waiting and you had your yellow legal pad of paper there and you were going to do a live case of, of, about one of your, um, the companies you work with and you, you get up to the podium and you're about to start the live case and you bring the pad with you and say, and you lay it down and there you go, before I get started, I have some comments about current events and you had taken copious, you filled an entire page of notes about the, the 10 minute conversation we were having about all the suggestions and then the one that we ended up talking about. And then you just, you gave some commentary on it, which I thought was quite insightful. But I was like, I've had dozens of people in my class, incredibly accomplished people, CMOs, presidents of, um, of organizations, 
entrepreneurs, VCs, and I've never had anyone behave like that. And it was like, I was like, yeah, this guy just likes to think more deeply and more creatively than the average person. And I love to find, I love to find connections that aren't obvious. And I think, I don't know if, you know, I know we're running long here, but maybe briefly we'll mention the story you and I met while you were writing your book, The Humor Code, uh-huh. through an improv school called Upright Citizens Brigade, uh, where I was one of the pupils they had brought chapter to Chapter two. He's in chapter two, people. Yeah, it's a real embarrassing <laughs> line, guys. Don't go read that line. Anywho, uh, we had met as, they, you know, we were demonstrating different improv sort of practices for you and Joel, who is your co-author. And I think the reason I like improv comedy is... Comedians that do great improv think about their show the same way I think about entrepreneurship and business concepts, which is they hear a bunch of different ideas. Uh They try to figure out how they can elevate those ideas to make them bigger and funnier. And then they try to figure out how to combine all of them. If anybody listening to this is familiar with UCB or with uh, the format of an improv show called The Herald, the whole crux of the show is that it has this rising action that in the final beat is supposed to connect everything together. And I think that's just naturally how I think. Yeah. And uh, so thank you for that. And by the way, I think, you know, anybody who uh, I've spoken to in any of your classes absolutely adores you and thinks it's the greatest thing that's ever happened (laughs) to them, which I think for college students who often are, are, well, they're not all jaded, but I think many are that I think you're, uh, you're definitely going above and beyond. I don't know. I, yeah, I try. I don't know if they all do, but um, I think you I had, like a, think you had a section fighting with another section <laughs> about <laughs> Professor McGraw. Who do you love more, morning section or afternoon section? It's the afternoon section, right? They were having a huge debate over it. I always say I hate you equally. <laughs> um, so I want to bring this back um, to you showing up here. And so I'm actually starting to work on some ideas related to improv and business um, here um, with my host, Adam Barsky. And I remember um, your arrival threw my schedule completely off. And I'm always worried about that. I'm Well, on one hand, my, my rituals are beneficial and make me happier and healthier. On the other hand, I worry about becoming a rigid old man. Mm. And I remember thinking I should just yes and this. Right. I should just act like improv, which is in a scene, your your mate shows up out of nowhere and you don't go, dude, what are you doing here? I already have plans tonight. That ruins a scene. Well, basically, this was a scene. If this was an improv show, you had just done a scene where you were clearly an astronaut on the moon. <laughs> and then I came plowing through with my <laughs> rainbow semi truck. Yes. And you're like, well, I guess we're doing this scene now. Yes. And you were seamless in your transition. Yeah, I, I think that um, having taken improv and, and studying it actually has helped me help make that easier mm-hmm. thing to do. Okay, what are you listening to reading or uh, watching that really stands out? So you had already mentioned Ray Dalio's book. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start long form. Um, if we're talking about TV and that sort of consumption, what, it has to be really good, not just normal run of the mill good. What? Give me an example of TV that's run of the mill good, so I can have what's better than that. It's my best most friend. most TV yeah. that people regularly watch and like. Yeah. You know, I mean, t- if you haven't watched Rick and Morty, mm-hmm. all of Rick and Morty, I think you owe it to yourself to watch that, which was uh, an incredible accomplishment. Okay. Um, yes. I don't want to mention too many other no, just one fiction fiction shows. Uh, on the book side, Beyond uh, Principles, of course, is amazing. I think was that you that turned me on to Anti Fragile? Yeah, the Nassim Taleb. Nassim book. Taleb, which is a very painful book to read, but is a wonderful book. Yeah. Um, I listen to podcasts from a guy named Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Uh, called Invest Like the Best. You turned me on to that. And where it converged with my favorite blog was when he interviewed Tim Urban, which is brilliant if you guys are curious at all about Elon Musk, who invited Tim Urban to come be with him so mm-hmm. that he could explain what Elon is trying to accomplish. I don't want to give it away. Just go listen to it. It's yeah, amazing. I'll put it up in the, in the exhibits. But for consumption, to me, the state of the art now is I 
kind of hate to admit this, I think it's Twitter. Uh -huh. And this is, by the way, when I spoke with your students, I asked them, you know, what platforms are all of you on? And of course, there's lots of hands for Instagram and lots of hands for Facebook. Yes. And when I say, well, how many of you NBA students who are trying to change the world are on Twitter? There's like four people that raise their hand, which to me is insane because it's the only social platform of ideas. It's not about your coffee. It's not about your birthday party. It's about sharing ideas, sometimes debating ideas. And for that reason, I think anybody who is trying to improve themselves or to build something in their life should be on Twitter. And by the way, don't follow your friends. Your friends can be on Instagram. Your family can be on Facebook. Follow the 25 people you want to be. So in that case, I follow people like Elon Musk. Uh, I follow David Axelrod. I feel uh, follow people uh, in the blockchain and crypto space um, who I think are going to be honest and are going to give a, a good balanced assessment mm -hmm. of the direction that we're going. I follow people like Vitalik Buterin who created Ethereum, uh, which is a crypto coin and uh, a platform for smart contracts. Uh, I think going to Twitter, that should be number one, even though I know I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to rattle off a bunch of different books. By the way, Naval, who you and I have spoken about a lot on this trip, who's the CEO of AngelList, who's an avid reader, uh, his Twitter is fantastic, and you'll also get wonderful book recommendations from him. Uh, what he's uh, sort of converging all this together, he's not only given me Twitter content and great books to read, he's actually helped, because of Twitter, reframe how I try to read books, where in the past I would just yeah. read a book A to Z because I thought that's what you did with a book. Right. What Naval's convinced me is that, well, I should read a book until I get it. Once I understand the concept and I have enough examples in my mind that it's going to stick with me, I should move on to the next book and learn the next idea. But then over time, you should sort of amass this grouping of whether it's 50 books or 100 books that are the most important to you. And you should go back and reread those ones to reinforce those. And I think that uh, that's definitely changed me a lot. Yeah. I hate to say this because it's free for download on humorcode.com. But if you want, if you just read the first chapter of the humor code, you kind of get it. Sure. Fair enough. You kind of get it, especially if you care about the pop science part of it. Well, and most great ideas that are being properly communicated don't need 225 pages. Yes, because the truth is most people don't need to get into that fourth layer deep or fifth layer yes. deep of it because it's not going to have any use in their life. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's, by the way, this is something every author should admit. And most authors, of course, will never do it. And a lot of authors, of course, for that reason, should probably make their books significantly shorter than they make them. Yeah, although it's not always the author's fault. Like, so when we signed the contract for the humor code, the contract says you'll deliver a book 70,000 words or longer. Um, so, all right, last question. The secret to success. Hold on. Everyone knows, but can't seem to do. You know, the obvious secret to success, but people don't seem to be able to do it. I think Darwin's leaning, Darwin's leaning in for this one. Yeah, this is, well, I feel like I could go 20 different directions. To me, the most obvious way to get ahead that I think is at the same time intuitive to people, and yet everything in their fiber tells them don't do this so they don't, is to be contrarian. Okay. If you think about in the financial world, you should invest when everybody's panicking. Mm -hmm. You should sell when everybody thinks this is... Everybody's buying. Yeah, everybody's buying. In the business world, you should go after the opportunities that look the most tumultuous and look the most difficult versus everybody tries to follow the same trends at the same time, which means there's all these competitors. Mm -hmm. I don't want to compete against everybody. I want to compete against the least amount of people right. humanly possible. So if now all the trend in crypto has, you know, uh, is in a bubble, you should try to find what are those things that are maybe not sexy, seem complicated, mm. but aren't being served. I think you would look at going after how much money America spends, you know, in proportion to our GDP on healthcare. Mm -hmm. There's got to be lots of ways you can make so many efficient moves and grow incredibly lucrative companies there. Maybe it's working with the elderly. I think when it comes to uh, to love, because I think maybe we'll hit all the little beats, 
right? You don't want to you don't want to go to the dating pool where there's you know if you're if you're the straight as uh, my friend Richard A would call me. Uh, if you're the straight, you don't want to go to where there's a hundred men and five women, uh-huh. right? You want to go to where there's a hundred women and five men. If yes. you're trying to increase your odds of a fantastic mate. So I think going against the yeah. grain, I would say when people zig, I want to zag. That's it. And I think we all know that's true. It's hard to do. It's, it's so hard to true. And you know, I think I wonder, I always question what are people afraid of? And it must be, Something biological where if your ancestor in the past was the daring one, they died. Yeah. So it was better to try to farm the barren field than to go across the ridge to the field that was green and looked like it had a great water supply because maybe there's a wolf over there. Yeah, so it's the classic kind of negativity bias, loss aversion, and, and so on. So here's what I thought you were going to say based upon our conversation. Start your own business? Uh, no. Get a good night's sleep. Right? It's everybody knows that sleep is good for you. Totally right on. You have totally right on. Your entire life is evidence that getting a good night's sleep is good for you, and yet people manage to not prioritize getting a good night's sleep. I would actually say that not only that, but I think that's the only sort of health and lifestyle science that's not controversial. Whether you should eat a lot or eat a little, be all vegetarian, eat all meat, all of that, there's multiple sides. Is there anybody arguing you should get less sleep? And not really, no. Not really. For you, why do you think that is that people won't prioritize it? I think actually that there's really... It's not taught as a skill in the same way that... that I think we have... I think that's It's easy fair. to steal. And the other thing is, is it feels somewhat fungible, right? It feels like I can take an hour here or there um, and that people don't have good, a good boundary for like... I actually think that having a strong boundary for when you're going to go to sleep makes you more efficient earlier in the day. That if you allow yourself to not have a boundary there, then you can you can steal that extra hour and you can waste it or earlier. I mean, part of the reason I'm I am productive is because that is precious. It's not it's sacred. So if it hasn't gotten done by eleven o'clock, it's not getting done. Um, and that's some of that's values and and do you think i think by the way the value that people have that are on the other side of this equation i just think we have this subconscious puritan uh uh driver behind all of us and i think part of the puritan logic is that a if you go to sleep late yeah you're a slacker right right if you sleep too long you're a slacker yeah and i think even though we now know there is science that says if you get longer better sleep you will accomplish more in less amount of time during the day than the person who got five hours of sleep and appears to be working for 18 hours, but they're in zombie mode. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, and that's a nice idea. I, I don't know. I mean, to me, some of it is, I'll be really selfish, is I like to feel good. As the reason why you do sleep. Yes. I like, I like to feel good. I want to be in a good mood. I want to enjoy my life. And I know that if I get six and a half or fewer hours certainly less than six hours, I am less happy. I don't have the same energy. I just don't feel as good. And you're not doing anybody else any favors. No, because I'm already going to be a pain in the ass enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hey, Darwin, I, I knew this would happen. Congratulations. You went longer than Jimmy Carr. Wow! <laughs> um, thanks for doing this, Rumi. And uh, maybe we'll do this again in a couple years. Can't wait to... Jump you in Dubai. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be great. That I'll sounds, do this again. If that sounds weird. Dubai. I can't wait to <laughs> break down your door when you're in Dubai. Cool. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit PeterMcGraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation on I'm Not Joking.